So I think, and we're there. Excellent. Um, cool. Well, it looks like we have um, three items on the list for now. So we've got some progress in the discretized doc. Wanted to chat a bit about examples for um, Ken Gio, putting together a bit of a SimPeg finder. Um, and then also, um, there was an email that came around about uh, how Felix's old cluster is going to be used at UBC. And they're um, planning on installing, um, uh, Phil Austin is leading the charge on that, planning on installing Ken Gio on there, which is pretty cool. Oh, nice. Okay, so that will be Phil Austin that take care of that. Um, I, I think like on well, officially or unofficially, I don't know. Like, Doug, you might you might know more about about that. Uh, uh, Phil is the lead person on that, but it's it, there's actually a strong connection with you know general computing UBC because uh, UBC is picking up I think a big portion of some maintenance charge or something like that. But but Phil is going to be, you know, I, I think sort of the lead guy from our end. Okay. Like will you have access to that? Or is it like specific to Phil's research group? Oh no, I think I think it would be anybody in ESB and maybe anybody from campus wide. Excellent. Hmm. I, I think it's I think it's kind of getting lumped in with you know general UBC high performance computing. Excellent. Um, so, like, I guess the connection that I just wanted to share on my end so that you guys all, all know and sort of can keep this in the radar. Um, I'm, we're potentially going to be putting in um, a grant, like, with Pangeo or related to Pangeo. So I'm working quite closely with the Pangeo group. So as questions and things like that come up, um, like, I'm happy to serve as a connection point. Um, I also think that this is a real opportunity for us to actually bring SimPeg into the Pangeo world. Um, yeah. So like, when they first install Pangeo, SimPeg probably won't be in that image. Um, but I think that like very rapidly, we should make the case that SimPeg should be installed and available campus-wide. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And so that's where having a handful of examples um, will be quite useful. Uh, so some stuff that we can showcase. Mm -hmm. um, and so like, I, I don't think we need to have tons to start with. I think we just need like two or three very well done notebooks that do a, a moderately hard computation. I don't think it needs to be anything um, crazy, but like something that runs in parallel. Um, if we get a nice mag example, like it would be nice if we're working with open source data so something that we can download from the Canadian government or um, that we've already gotten permission to share widely um, would be, yeah, quite beneficial. Mm -hmm. And then too, if there's something you can think of that like within the department would spark somebody else's interest and get them excited about using SimPeg, like let's take note of that and, and make that happen. I was thinking we should just do like uh, we did for the toolkit, right? We uh, we just set up an inversion, uh, like an app to run inversions, and then uh, on the public oh, data right. set of, uh, of the GSC. Right. It's uh, yeah. It's actually like you got most of the stuff done already. Yeah, it's just make putting the app together. Yeah, mm. like something like that would be amazing. We need to get desk inverse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's totally fair. So that, I guess, comes back to the, the simulation class, really. OK. Um, Dom, do you have, like, you sent me a couple examples. Um, is that, are, are the examples that you sent, are they running off of master? Well, then uh, I sent you that uh, on your yeah. on our Direct message? Yeah, um, like last week. Um, no, that's the thing. Yeah, this one, uh, this one needs Dask to uh, to run. So um, I will I will do a short PR now that uh, the PF is in. I'll do a short PR just to update for the Dask uh, the Dask parallelization. Okay. And then uh, that will take us like then we'll be able to do that kind of uh, larger scale inversions. Excellent. 
Yeah, so like, let's get that in. Um, we can try and get that in pretty quickly. And then I think like with the simulation, we're gonna end up refactoring some stuff, but like that's totally fine. Like let's get yeah. let's get some shining examples um, mm -hmm. out into the world. Sounds great. What are the computing power looks like, Lindsay? Like, um, is that like, um, are they actually providing actual computers as well? Well, it's Felix's old cluster. Uh, pardon me? It's Felix's old cluster. Oh, so we're going to launch the pan, like a, oh, hold on. So who's going to launch that? Like, is that the Felix, like the Austin is launching and we're basically using it or we're actually launching like our Pangeo into like that cluster. How how are things actually working? So so they will build like they will have their own Pangeo deployment. So by they, mm -hmm. um, Phil and with the help of Henrik, will launch their own Pangeo deployment on right. the Felix's old cluster. So like they're gonna have a specific Jupiter Hub configuration that's based on the Pangeo configuration um, right. that will be accessible to like whoever is able to access it. Um, so in, in, right. On our end, it's basically the same as running on Binder. Is that right? Uh, not quite. Um, okay. it's, it's actually closer to running on like the UDC Jupyter Hub. Oh, OK. So like, they have a pre-populated software environment <laughs> we can still pip install stuff, but the case that we want to make very quickly is that they should have Simpeg in the base image so that like you could just import Simpeg from Felix's or from their Pangeo in installation right away. Right. Then who's going to like a, so are we going to have like a sort of admin access that we can install stuff and set the uh, environmental variables and stuff or to help me help us to set that up how like um so i don't know but i think that that's like an important thing that everyone at ubc um like just keep your keep involved in that conversation because mm -hmm. ideally what they should do is they should create like a public repository that describes the deployment mm -hmm. and then we can make pull requests to it so that would be like the ideal workflow is that Phil or whoever is administering this, they have a public GitHub repository that describes the setup. Right. Um, and then like we could add files or we can, we should be able to add suggestions to their base, like environment.yaml or however they choose to set it up um, to okay. say these are the additional things that we would request that you include. Okay. Sounds good. So you guys are not on the end. You guys are not on the channel, eh? On the Optimum Cluster channel? Um, no. Nope. Uh, you should have received an invite from Phil to join the uh, the EOS, and then there's a private channel for uh, for it. Oh, I don't think I'm on the private channel, Don. I'll invite you. I'll try to invite you. Yeah. I mean the Slack one, right? Slack channel. Yeah, Slack. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so like if there's, um, and it sounds like Dom, you're probably the most connected at this point. Um, so if you can sort of just like help nudge some things so that we can um, be a part of the conversation there, I think that, that that would be huge at this stage. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Phil told me, uh, uh, like Prof Austin told me a while back, right, that he was uh, hoping to get it going, but it looks like it's happening this term. So that's a good thing. Yeah, that's really exciting. Excellent. Yes. We'll now. Busy. <laughs> cool. um, Dom, did you did you have any further conversation or? Anybody else at, up at UBC have comments or things like that that you want to add with respect to the Pangeo? Uh, so uh, I, I could easily have uh, a, a little bit of a chat with with, with Phil. Um, what are, what would be the main things to try to get from our perspective? I mean, you, you talked about a public repository <laughs> that describes the setup. Yeah. 
Uh, what else? Um, I guess too, like it, it would be worth asking how closely connected they are to Pangeo and how closely connected they want to be. Um, Cause I can try and help make connections where needed. Um, and then I think too, like how open basically they will be to um, including packages and things like that, like Simpeg. Uh, what well, would be the nice way to ask the last one about including Simpeg? I guess, or like, how will um, how will decisions be made about including additional packages? Like, what I, that's I guess the question is like, what's the decision making process for? What kind of access point will will have? You know, it's not necessarily what access point because if there's a public repository, then that's the access point. But then there's the question of like, are they willing to merge our pull request, <laughs> basically? Just gonna try something here just for the for our sound. Lindsay, can you try to say something now? Yeah, sure. Is that any better? Oh yeah. Can can you? Because my speakers are not very strong, so I'm trying to con like, and I don't have the HDMI, so I'm trying to connect to the to the sound of the room. Oh okay. And the resolution of the camera is really poor. Eh? How yeah. come it's? Uh... Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, Timo, are you using your laptop camera? Yeah, I'm using my laptop, so I have like the that connector with, but it's it's not to the HDMI. It's like uh, I don't remember the name, like the VGA or something like that. Okay. So it's, it it doesn't have the sound on it, so it, it has a special it has a special cable on the jack, but I feel it's not very it's not very strong. Okay. Yeah, um, I will figure out something for next meeting. Okay. So it's gonna be on the on the laptop computer for now. Fair enough. Um, okay, any other comments on that the NGO topic? No comment. Okay. All right. Yeah, so what's, uh, Lindsay, what's uh, sort of the current plan? Like, uh, are we going to be going on the binder first? And then, because I think uh, we, we don't really know how how fast this uh, Pangeo de deployment in uh, Felix Cluster will happen, I guess. Yeah, so we, um, I think the, the purpose of the binder, so yes, we deploy the binder first. We okay. want to showcase what Simpeg can do and basically make the case as to why it should be much more widely available to people through a platform like Pangeo. So the purpose of these notebooks is to demonstrate the workflow and start getting it into the hands of other people. So we'll have like a two, maybe two, two or three examples on Binder. That's a, that's a start. Yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, cool. Oh, the other thing I want to talk about is... Um, Um, okay, so the docs, I've deployed um, a rough version of the discretized docs to uh, Google App Engine. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, but the URL is in the notes. 
Okay, can you all see that? Yep. Okay. Um, so what I've tried to do is I showed this briefly last time, um, but show like have some getting started, some motivation as to why you're going to use discretize, how to install it, that sort of stuff. Um, have a user guide. And so the user guide will be all Python scripts that are then built by um, like the Sphinx gallery. So everything should include code and this whole thing I can download as a Jupyter notebook and understand. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. and it like, just talks you through various pieces. So this one just talks about here's some different meshes, here's how you count the things, here's what faces and edges are, that sort of thing. Um, nice. There's one looking at tensor meshes. Um, so just the basic concepts, how do you set it up? Um, how do you move the origin? Uh, how do you use different cell sizes? And then like, why would you use something like the mesh tensor? Um, and conceptually, what's that doing? Um, then I think, I don't remember if these ones, so this one is currently like a very short RST page. This should be translated over to um, a, a Python script. And same thing with inner products, for example, these things should be transferred over. Um, but that's okay. I think that we can sort of get this going as is and then start making issues about what kind of examples and use cases we need to demonstrate in the docs like to make this useful. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I've been working on and is still not, there's still a few kinks to work out, um, but I think this is getting closer. This is very oh, much nice. following the um, uh, Leo's work in the Verde docs. Hmm. Um, so for That's the nice. API, so is everyone clear on like the separation between the user guide and the, the API? reference like what they're yeah. yeah so okay yeah um yeah so here the api we're actually going in and documenting all of the classes so if you go in and look at tensor mesh it shows you what it inherits from and then this is um so i'm working on this with franklin or i've been in touch with franklin he's he's doing the work i'm talking um, and <laughs> so the, the, there's a distinction between like the um, NumPy style documentation, which will render more like this, and then the more custom, or, like the basic Sphinx style, which renders like this. So eventually all of these will be closer to this. Um, so that gives you all of the properties. One of the things that this is like brought to light for me, and I think this is a broader question that we should think about is like, Right now we've got multiple ways to access identical information. And I don't know if we actually wanna continue doing that. So for example, um, all of the information that you need for vector number of edges X, or sorry, no, um, that's not strictly true. Um, hmm. So like number of faces X, can be grabbed from vector number of faces. So, uh, you know, it's two different ways to access the same information. Um, uh, yeah. Do we, I mean, cause just looking at this documentation like is intimidating how much stuff is on this object. Um, mm. And so that's okay. I don't think we need to solve that now, but it's just, it's something to keep in mind. <laughs> um, this is a bug that will get figured out. Um, there should be just a quick summary of each of the methods here. And then we can look below at the actual documentation. So this is still in the same exact page. This just scrolled me down to the right place, um, which describes the docs for, for get face inner product, for example. The other thing that Leo implemented, which I think is super cool, is so after it describes all the methods, then you can actually see which examples use this class. So if you wanted to see examples of it in action, um, you can click on any one of these and it takes you to a working Python script that makes use of that class. Nice. Can I ask a question there? Yeah, absolutely. How do you, uh, how do you specify which figure you want for the, for the thumbnail? Because uh, uh, all the examples that I published, it's all the same image that's showing up, you know? Can you specify? 
You can. I don't remember how. Um, okay, that's okay. I'll re I'll search it. Yeah, you you totally can, but I don't remember. Off no, that's the I think it's a pretty simple command you need to just insert somewhere. <laughs> um, you can. That's the important. Uh, that's the important answer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is possible. Um, so what I'm trying to do right now is get first of all get the API reference like the the methods being described properly. So here when we look at the the tensor mesh, um, like this table should be filled in and is not currently and I don't know why. Hmm. Um, so once that is sorted and once the build roughly passes, um, then I think we can merge it. By roughly passes, what I mean is, is this has brought to light a lot of um, uh, links that are not properly rendered in the documentation and all of that sort of stuff. So what I would like to do is then we'll merge this and then we'll create a branch um, called docs or something like that, where we'll put more strict testing on the documentation and just ask that as people have time, you know, if you spend half an hour once a week, just beating on the docs a little bit, um, we'll get them into shape. Um, but yeah, I think we can sort of get it into a state where it's good enough, let's merge it, um, we can keep developing and then sort of hit on the docs and try and try and get them cleaned up um, as a group. Is that How do you build that locally, uh, Lindsay? Because uh, I'm trying, uh, I tried so many times to build the Simpact docs on uh, like on my machine and it's always crashing. Uh, is there anything special uh, with the new format or? Um, so there is a make file. So let me show you, sorry, let me see if I have the, um, Discretized blocks. Okay. So, one thing that I did have to do is inside the docs, there is um, a make file. So, this is not the make file on the outside of the docs, this is inside. Um, I did actually go in and modify the um, the HTML. So, the, the way that we build is slightly different. So Dom, was it failing because it was like a Windows make file thing, or was it failing because we had um, paths that were not Windows friendly? I will double. I will double check. But uh, you're telling me that if I am on uh, currently, if I go to the uh, to discretize your branch, I could build. I, I should be able to build it locally. Is that you're saying? Yeah. So you should be able to to grab the current branch. Which let me tell you, it's it's called Repo Cleaner. Okay. You should be able to um, check that out. You should be able to CD into the docs and then run make HTML. HTML, OK. Let me and try that it should build. If it doesn't, then we can we can sort through that, because it is important that, that you be able to build them too. Yeah, because it's going to take too long otherwise, eh? Yeah. OK, one sec. Inside the docs, yes? Yeah, inside the docs. OK, one sec. That's, uh, I'll try. I'm, I, I'm missing a few Sphinx thing, but uh, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so then with that too, actually, while I've got the code up, I'm going to show you just like what the um, NumPy style documentation looks like. I know we showed it briefly, but I think it's actually quite amazing to me how much more readable the doc string is even in the, even in the code. So just having stuff like this where you've got, you know, an example and then there's some code underneath. Um, and then even looking at, oh, it's the inner products where to me it was like quite striking how different. Just reading like the parameters um, and returns to me is so much nicer than the previous like colon param, um, whatever. Yeah. Like, yeah. This, is, this is very clean and friendly. Um, so I'm I'm all in for going for this format. Um, so we can check it out. I've cleaned up the TensorMesh, the inner products, and the base classes. Um, but then I'll make some issues as to like what hasn't been done yet, and we can sort of break it up into small chunks so that even if you've got ten minutes and want to go in and fix the docs for um, the sill mesh or whatever, it, it shouldn't be a hard thing to do. So this is the NumPy style? That's not NumPy style, right? 
Th this is NumPy style. Oh, and then what's the other? That's like, the default sure? Sphinx. Oh, Sphinx style. Okay. Yeah, it's it's sort of the default style. Um, what I can do is um, there's a nice example right here, and I'll I'll just add this to our Google Doc that just shows like some of the um, NumPy style docs and and how to write them. Okay. So I will add that here. So if um, I'll hopefully get the pull request like, set up in the next um, couple of days, and then I think that we should think about if this makes sense to everyone um, doing the same thing over in Snag. So we can play around with it here first. I think like Discretize is a nice place to learn these things, and then and then we can port it over if that works for everyone. Yeah, that's what you do, guys. Cool. Um, any, any questions with respect to that, or comments or thoughts before we move on? So we'll just hammer out uh, discretize first and then move on to Simpeg after. Is that the plan? Yeah, I think so. I mean, and there'll be some iteration, but this will at least be a, a good first pass. Yeah. Right. So you said Franklin was, was uh, on that too these days? Uh, Franklin is, so the properties, there's some auto documentation stuff that happens in the properties library. Um, and so uh, I've, there's a couple of people who have asked, is it possible to, to get the property stuff auto documenting in just like different styles? Um, and so that's something he's interested in in making happen. So I will um, check in with him and just see if there's stuff that you know we can do to to help make that happen. Okay. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So I sent you a screenshot, Lindsay. It, it builds, but all the images are all the images are broken. Okay. I bet I know it's going on there. It's probably escaping the, so people have pathed the figure locations with slashes. Um, uh, yeah, totally. So there might be an extra step that we actually have to insert into the build for Windows, unfortunately. Do a forward slash or a double backslash, yeah. Well, yeah, or the the OS like path step. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Um. Hmm. That's wrong. Okay. Um, is that like completely crippling, or are you able to? No, no, because uh, all the rest, the text shows in the HTML, so that's okay. I just can't see the uh, the output of the. Uh, but that doesn't matter. Yeah, okay. I can start yeah, helping out with the uh, the API. Yeah, feel free to make an issue of that so that we don't forget about it. Um, but it probably won't get prioritized if we don't need it like right away. Yeah, totally. Um, cool, cool. Okay. Um, the other thing that. I wanted to talk about was yeah the the meeting with Jennifer and an EM tutorial for that. Um, so we're scheduled, I believe, for next Monday or Tuesday, something like that, um, which is actually coming up pretty quick. Um, so what I was thinking, and I meant to get to this last week, but did not, um, is to start a tutorial, like get a notebook together based on um, Bootpreneur. Do one time domain, one frequency domain, and and chat through, um, I think just using like the core SimPeg for now. So do the sill mesh so that they can go to 3D right away. Cause I think they're pretty interested in 3D. Um, 
and then we can we can introduce like Soggy's extra notebooks for using Simpake EM1D if that's if that's where they're more interested in, in going. Um, so yeah, I don't have who's able to join that? Actually, let me just look and see. Um, so it was going to be at 8.30 a.m. on on the 29th. <coughs> um, so are there people um, like Soggy and Tom and Thibaut, are you guys able to join that? Uh, yeah, like, what's what's the date, Lindsay? The 29th. Mm -hmm. Probably work. Yeah, so like that will be like uh, you will broadcast that on GeoSci or? What yeah, we'll do, we'll do a Hangout style meeting. Um, so people can come and go as they need to. But it would be nice if, yeah, if a few of us are able to be there. Um, to sort of see how this goes, I think it'd be a first conversation, and then we'll probably end up doing some follow up, either asynchronously or another call um, after we've got them sort of up and running. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll reply to her today. I just realized that I had not done that. Okay. Um, and then the only, was, was there any other comments or like thoughts on, on those? Um, no. Well, I think we got most of the materials, right? That the uh, prime domain, frequency domain, EM, like uh, the example that we've made for your paper is actually enough, right, Lizzie? Yeah, I think that that's, that's a good one. I, what I like about Book Pranang, though, is we're actually taking real data. Um, right, right. So that was in your paper. Like, uh, we yeah, used that yeah. for the paper example. Yeah. So, yeah. like, it should be, shouldn't be a problem, I guess. Yes. So that shouldn't be a problem. I just want to revive that and actually put it into a documented notebook because right now it's right. just a giant script. Right. That's a script. Right. Yeah. So that I think is the only step. So what I might do is I'll make just like a small repository and then I will invite you all to it. And then if there's anything that you want to add or, or hit on with it, um, we can do that. Right, then like, are you going to deploy that on Binder or like a, we're just like, just I think we'll just get them to, to download it and, and run it um, because they're going to be using their own tools for this anyways. Right. Um, okay. So I think if we can get them Right. Like running the notebook on their machine, that's best. And I, and I believe that they've already installed Simpeg and like have that stuff running. We can send it up to Binder so that if they don't, then it's fine. But yeah. Yeah, so that shouldn't be too bad. Um, cool. so the last thing that um, I didn't put on the list, but just wanted to mention, because I'll try and get this probably next week in place. Um, I basically have a sketch together of a, um, a way to manage the GeoSci apps. Um, let me see if I can show you. I may not actually have this ready to be shown. Um, Okay, so what I've done, I'm just going to send this through on the Google Doc. I have a um, a library started called no, uh, NB Librarian. So the idea being it's a notebook librarian. Um, there's zero documentation on it right now. Um, but the idea is, is that there are two files that you will need to create. Um, and I'll create demos of this. Um, actually, I think I have it just a sec. Um, 
Okay, I'm just going to share my screen again. Okay, can you guys see that? Yep. Okay, so there's there's two files that'll be important for this to run. Um, there's one that's called libraryconfig.yaml, and it's a fairly simple file. All it has in it right now is, um, so GitHub information, so which user, which GitHub user hosts the repository or organization, uh, which repository it is. So right now we're looking at the GeoSci Labs repository. Um, I wanted to specify a branch name so that, for example, if Dequan's running a course, he wrote a notebook, that, or one of his grad students wrote a notebook yesterday and they need it in their students' hands tomorrow, um, he could actually switch this to whatever his branch is. Um, and then there's a directory of where the notebooks live so that when I search for the notebooks on the NB librarian side, um, I can search just part of the repository rather than the whole thing. Um, then there's two environment setup things. Um, and so one is the, in, like, you, you don't actually have to specify both of these, but I think it's easiest if we do. Um, what this does is it'll look for the environment file that we specify in um, the GeoSci Labs repository, and it's going to download that for you. And then because we've specified the requirements, it's also going to do that for you. So it's going to just grab those files so that basically at the end of the day, you end up with a repository that is um, binderizable very easily. Okay. Okay. Um, right. uh, so then, does that make sense to everyone? Before I keep talking. Um. Okay. I'm gonna take the silence as that makes sense. If not, you can feel free to jump in. Um, um, Soggy, you have a question? No, uh, go ahead, Lizzie. Okay. So then the next file that you need is this .jupyter include file. What this is, is it's very similar to, you, everyone's seen like a git ignore file, right? Yep. Okay. So I'll show you the structure of that. It's a very simple name matching, file matching um, system. So here, for example, for the Sphinx documentation, we ignore everything that's under the docs slash build. Like that's just not going to be going into the um, the Git uh, history, right? And the way that Git keeps track of that is it looks for any file that has this um, string characters in it. Um, and then it says, okay, just ignore those files. Don't add them to Git. So the Jupyter include is doing basically the same logic, but backwards. Um, and so in this case, I'm saying, okay, I want this exact notebook, um, this exact notebook, but I could also just specify um, like this, that would do the exact same thing, okay? What's kind of nice about this is then for if you, are running 350 and we know that we want all of the mag notebooks you could just add let's just do mag and everything under mag similarly let's do inversion and everything under inversion oh nice does that make sense yeah yeah okay. the other one that's kind of neat too is like so in this case under electromagnetics let's say i saw the sphere examples and i want all of those so then what this does is says okay anything with sphere in the file name I want you to download that's under electromagnetics. Hmm. So that gives you a bit of an idea of the logic. Okay. Okay. And then with the um, NB librarian package, I've written basically a command line interface so that you can just set up the library. Um, and you can update, you can update from there as well. So I'll, I'll send, what I would like to do is get um, maybe GPG labs, sort of, I'll, I'll um, create an example that, that uses this. Um, and then we can see what that looks like and see if that works with everyone.
just on perhaps the longer term, and on, on the, the longer term, why we sort of separated it into two files. So what's kind of cool that I was talking to UV about, and I think that this would be a fun thing to, to work on, is that we could actually basically write um, a Jupyter server extension um, that looks at the Jupyter include file um, and then basically only shows you the notebooks that satisfy that include. And so what would be really nice in that sense is that instead of every instructor having to create their own courses repository, all that they have to do is write the .jupyter include um, and then keep that with the repository. Um, and so you, we, there's no more diverging or copying of notebooks anymore. You can always just basically have your repository and then the Jupyter include and choose what you're going to expose to students. Nice. Um, so that's sort of like a lot of the motivation behind the structure that doesn't currently exist. Um, but that's sort of why, why this is set up the way it is. Oh, cool. That's nice. So like uh, all the physical like uh, codes and notebooks is in the Geosite labs, right? Yes. Yeah, that, that sounds pretty nice. Any questions with that? Then let's say like a Jaja has their own version and Dequan has their own version. They're, they're going to have like a different branch. Is that correct? Um, so ideally, all development happens inside of GeoSci Labs. So any new notebook, right, right, anything right. that they want to do, they branch and create a pull request. So ideally, right. like, hopefully, it doesn't just completely diverge. We want stuff feeding back into master. Um, but yes, right. the development happens there. And then all that they do with their like GeoSci course repository is then run this NB librarian update, basically. Right. And then it goes to the GitHub repository and says, oh, yeah, these ones changed. Let me grab them um, and give them to my course now. Yeah, so for instance, like a Dequan want to like deploy their uh, course on Binder, they're going to generate some sort of like a, a branch, then deploy that branch into Binder. Is that is that what that what's going to happen or no? So he'll create a GeoSci, he'll fork GeoSci courses, mm -hmm. which basically has the skeleton of all the command line interface to. Um, uh, like it, it has all the NB librarian commands that you need in order to set up and fetch all the notebooks that you want. So let's say that Dequan wants one notebook from DC Resistivity, one from EM, da 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 da. So all he's going to do is fork the GeoSci courses repository, change the Jupyter include, um, run like a command that says grab me those notebooks, and then he will send that repository up to Binder. Now, if he discovers a mistake or wants to, to change something in the notebook, he's going to go back over to GeoSci Labs. He's going to make that fix, do a pull request on GeoSci Labs, and then run an update on his course. And all the update does is just says, oh, yeah, I'm just going to grab that notebook. Does that make sense? You look frozen, Zoggy. So yeah, I think that maybe see at see if at some point we see in action will be a bit clearer too. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but conceptually and like the the file format, do those sorts of things? Does that kind of make sense to everyone? At least as a first pass. Yeah, no, that that looked uh, readable. Excellent. Cool. Um, okay. We've got like 10 minutes left. I don't have any more items. Do other people have items, things you'd like to bring up? Um, yeah, on the go. Well, just with respect to the last email, uh, so Kevin will be coming here in uh, oh, more than a week. And uh, yeah, so if there are tasks that are kind of doable, I. I started a document, I sent it to him as well as to both you and, and Soggy. So that's just a place that we can kind of keep track of things that might 
uh, benefit him as well as our, ourselves. And so both from the point of view of uh, inversion tutorials and, and background as well as uh, various documentations, uh, just to have a, have a place to kind of put that together and that uh, everybody can kind of contribute. Excellent. I would like to uh, to say that uh, Nick is finally uh, simpegging, so that's that's awesome. Exactly. Yeah. Nick, what? right what's he doing? Uh, right now, it's just uh, equivalent source, you know, because uh, the the Fortran codes are broken, so he just leaped over and now he's running simpeg instead. <laughs> that's way better. Excellent. Nice. Like the, the Fortran code, is it because of the DLL libraries that are like all different uh, versions? Is that what's happening? No, no, it's uh, it's it's deeper than this. Uh, it has to do with topography and oh, okay. uh, yeah, it's it's in the in the code. All right, um, well, if that's it, then see everyone next week and we'll be in touch online. So, so next week, that's, uh, that's the EM thing too, so how? Right. right, I will follow up with um, a small GitHub repository and then um, I can start the, the Hangout from, from here. Um, and whoever is able and interested in joining certainly can. Okay. Sounds good. Excellent. Thanks, everyone. Bye, guys.